Hello everyone, this is Professor Keen. Today I'd like to talk about Chapter 5 in A Student's Guide to the Great Physics Text, Volume 3, where we talk about thunder and lightning. The reference is from Benjamin Franklin's Experiments and Observations on Electricity. In the previous two chapters, Chapters 3 and 4, we focused on Franklin's careful laboratory experiments, which culminated in his theory of electricity. But Franklin also had a very strong interest in the weather, and he wrote many scientific co correspondences on meteorological topics such as water spouts, trade winds, and thunderstorms. Franklin's interest in meteorology and electricity converged in his famous kite experiment. This dangerous experiment is described in detail in his letter 11, which is transcribed in this chapter. On a closely related topic, Franklin describes also the use of lightning rods to protect buildings from damage. This is in his letter 59, which is also included in this chapter. Sandwiched between these two scientific letters, I've also included one of Franklin's more whimsical correspondences. In letter number 48, he provides friendly advice to a Miss Polly Stevenson, who is a daughter of a widow with whom Franklin lodged while he was serving as a diplomat in London before the onset of the American Revolution. So let's go ahead and take a look, first of all, at his letter number 11. In this letter, he describes his famous kite experiment, which is probably what Americans are most familiar with. So let's take a look at letter 11. And in this letter, he talks about, by the way, this is published in 1752. In this letter, he explains how electrical fire can be drawn down from the clouds by means of a pointed iron rod, which is placed atop a building. In other words, we can draw out the electrical fire from the clouds, either gradually or rapidly in the form of a lightning stroke. So it can also be, and this was uh, one of Franklin's main insights and perhaps what he's most famous for, it can be accomplished by means of a kite. So let's look at in his letter number 11. This is from 1752. And let's see if we can draw how he describes his kite. He mentions that you take a couple of wooden, oh, let me go back. You take a couple of wooden cedar strips like this and this that form a cross. Try to draw it in a three dimensional form here. And then wrapped around this wooden cedar strip, you stretch a silk sheet. He makes this out of silk so that it's more waterproof. And then behind the silk, he also drags a tail with, he mentioned some ribbons tied to it. Let's make it look like this. Some ribbons tied to it like this. So these are the cedar strips. This is the silk handkerchief. This is the tail with the ribbons. And he also mentions that atop of this, you place a very sharp iron spike. So this is an iron spike or wire, I think is what he calls it. And then you have a loop of string like this, going like this to a string and then this string is held by a person. I'm just going to draw a stick person down here. That stick person, he mentioned, should stand underneath a roof so that they don't get wet while they're flying the kite. So there, maybe he's on a front porch, let's say, holding onto the string. And down here, there's a silk ribbon tied to the string. And that silk ribbon keeps a small key from sliding down. Okay, so we've got a key right here and a silk knot, you might say. And then you wait until a thunderstorm comes in. Here's your thunderstorm like this that comes in. And he mentions that electrical fire can be drawn from the thunderclouds by means of this iron wire. And this 
This electrical fire, he says, is drawn through the wire down the string like this toward the key. And you know that this is happening when the thunderstorm comes because there are tiny filaments on this twine that begin to stand up. So you might imagine if these, if there's positive electricity coming down this wire, all these little fibers become positively charged, they repel one another, and so they sort of stand out like this. So he says these loose filaments of the twine stand out on the string when the electric fire, as he says, is drawn from the thunder clouds. He goes on in this letter to explain how this stream of electric fire may be drawn from the key by putting your knuckle right by the key and you get a constant stream of sparks going from the key into your finger. As you might imagine, this is probably pretty dangerous because if there's a sudden stroke of lightning, it would go through there and down the string to you and perhaps electrocute you. And some subsequent experimenters who tried to reproduce what Franklin did, did in fact get electrocuted and die. There are some stories of this happening. Franklin, of course, didn't get electrocuted. He used his knuckle, he drew fire out of where the key is. He also held a Muschenbrook bottle here to store the charge. And one of the main results of this experiment is that Franklin recognized that the electricity that forms, well, the, the lightning that we see in the sky is the same kind of electricity as what he had been generating in his laboratory. In other words, lightning is, just is, electricity. This might seem obvious to you, but it was not at all obvious to early thinkers about this. In fact, all the different kinds of things that we see as electricity were kind of classified into different, um, different fields of study. So there was, um, there was frictional electricity, you know, by rubbing things, they produce these electrical effects. There was animal electricity. That is electricity that was studied by people like Galvani, who shocked the legs of frogs and showed that they twitched. So there, there was some kind of animal electricity there. There was chemical electricity. That was by using um, zinc and copper plates immersed in acids, you could create an electrical current. Um, there was also um, atmospheric electricity. And it wasn't entirely clear that these were um, the same phenomenon. They were perhaps quite different things. But there's eventually all of these will be unified into the broader study of electricity. So there's a unification that takes place. And when we're reading Franklin, we're starting to see this unification going on. Okay, so that's all I want to say about his letter number 11. Let's talk briefly about his letter number 48. And I might just read this. That might be easier to do than, than to uh, go through all the details with you because it's fairly short. So let me just go ahead and read this. This is a nice letter to, as I said, Miss Polly Stevenson, who was the daughter of a widow with whom Franklin stayed while he was visiting London. This is kind of neat because he gives some advice to this young girl. He says, I send my dear good girl the books I mentioned to her last night. I beg her to accept them as a small mark of my esteem and friendship. They're written in the familiar and easy manner for which the French are so remarkable and they afford a good deal of philosophic and practical knowledge, unembarrassed with the dry mathematics used by more exact reasoners, but which is apt to discourage young beginners. So here he's mentioning that he, he had sent her some books to read, and he's recommending these books um, primarily because they're, they're pleasant to read. He goes on to say, I would advise you to read with a pen in your hand and enter in a little book short hints of what you find that is curious or what may be useful, for this will be the best method of imprinting such particulars in your memory. 
where they will be ready either for practice or some future occasion if they are matters of utility, or at least to adorn and improve your conversation if they are rather points of curiosity. And, as many of the terms of science are such as you cannot have met with in your common reading, and may therefore be unacquainted with, I think it would be well for you to have a good dictionary at hand while reading, to consult immediately when you meet a word you do not comprehend the precise meaning of. This may at first seem troublesome and interrupting, but tis a trouble that will daily diminish as you will daily find less and less occasion for your dictionary, as you become more acquainted with the terms, and in the meantime you will read with more satisfaction because with more understanding. When any point occurs in which you would be glad to have further information than your book affords you, I beg you would in not in the least apprehend that I should think it a trouble to receive the answer and answer your question. It will be a pleasure and no trouble at all. For though I may not be able out of my own little stock of knowledge to afford you what you require, I can easily direct you to the books where it may most easily be found. Adieu, and believe me ever, my dear friend, yours affectionately, Mr. Benjamin Franklin. So this is a nice piece of advice on how one should go about the task of reading and learning by Benjamin Franklin. Now, before, um, before we finish our discussion of Benjamin Franklin, let's talk about his letter number 59. And in this letter, what Franklin does is he describes how to protect buildings from lightning damage. And he mentions that the matter of lightning really has been demonstrated to be this, the same as the matter of electricity. It's kind of a subtle fluid that flows down from the clouds. That's what he had talked about in his kite experiment. He also mentions that lightning is the re-equilibration of this fluid, which is out of equilibrium, and thunder is the accompanying sound of this lightning. And he mentions that equilibration can occur through a conductor, which will not be damaged, provided it is large enough in diameter. So this is where he suggests putting a metal lightning rod on top of tall buildings and attaching to them a metal wire that is attached to the, to the lightning rod and sunk all the way into the ground. He says metal and water are both very good conductors. On the other hand, there are poor conductors and many building materials like wood and lath and plaster are poor conductors and hence they are damaged when there is a flow of electricity through them. Electricity, he mentions, follows the path of least resistance, if it is given a choice, so to speak. He mentions also that the striking distance is the distance across which equilibration or sparking can occur through air. And this really depends on how much electrification difference there is between two points. So if there's a high difference in electrification between two points, then it's more likely that the electrification will jump across the air. In other words, the sparking distance will be much larger. But if there's a small difference in electrification, then you need to bring things very close before the air breaks down and sparks. A rod that's attached to the roof of the building and connected to a wire at least as thick as a goose quill, he says, can protect a building from strikes. This is on page 65 near the top. And he mentions that this rod should project about six or eight feet above the building and probably be gold covered or gold plated in order to prevent rust. There's a lot of very interesting advice he gives in this chapter about how to protect buildings um, from being damaged by lightning and also how you yourself might be protected from getting struck by lightning. He says, for example, in one of the paragraphs that if you're in a building, it's probably best during a thunderstorm not to stand directly under a chandelier because a chandelier has metal. The electricity will travel through the metals of the metal wires of the house through the chandelier and perhaps strike across the striking distance between the chandelier and your head. So he gives a number of different interesting um, suggestions in this chapter. It's a really fun read. I recommend you do it. It's a fairly easy read. And that will bring us to the end of our discussion of Benjamin Franklin. Next time, we'll go on to the work of the French scientist Coulomb.